So uh, today we're going to talk about one of my favorite subjects, which is money laundering. Oh, sorry, fintech. Uh, and uh, we have some distinguished guests. Uh, David Lighton is a CEO of SendFriend, uh, an old friend of mine and an expert on the remittance area where he's taken the initiative to try to start a company that basically has been successful in uh, helping people send remittances to poor countries like the Philippines from the United States specifically. Sandra Rowe, um, and I don't see Sandra on the line right now, but uh, she's joining us, I think at four, uh, is the uh, CEO of uh, the Global Blockchain Trade Council, organization of 220 institutions in more than 70 countries, um, graduate of Yale and of the London Business School, uh, you know, and spent, uh, did some time on Wall Street as well with Morgan Stanley, uh, but is an expert on the regulatory aspects of this question and some of the issues that her trade association is, uh, is facing. Um, and a frequent contributor to Coindesk. Uh, Francis Cargaro is a policy analyst uh, and a CPA based in uh, Nairobi. He's an expert on financial services, especially, especially in uh, African market. And uh, in this area, he knows quite a bit a lot, as we'll hear later on, about what Kenya has been doing on the for forefront of using fintech for mobile payments and uh, for even for blockchain and some of the problems that they've encountered with this. Uh, offline here, we have uh, our friends uh, Andres Frank in Germany. Uh, who is an expert uh, advisor to the EU on money laundering uh, and comes at this question from the concern of, you know, many regulators that uh, this is going to be very hard to, uh, uh, even harder than it is already uh, for us to uh, police money laundering, control kleptocracy, uh, do all the things with uh, what we need to do to uh, prevent uh, money laundering. On the other hand, uh, you know, he's, he can tell us a little bit about what what Germany is up to in this regulatory domain. Um, and uh, finally, uh, Ross Gaffney is a former FBI agent. Uh, he and I have actually spent time chasing money launderers around the Caribbean. He's done far more of that than I have, um, but can talk about some of the practical issues that he sees with some of the technologies that are coming up like uh, Bitcoin or cryptocurrency. Uh, not that we want to, uh, by any means, suggest that uh, these technologies are, uh, you know, there's a negative case, in fact, quite the opposite, but they do present issues and challenges for regulators and for law enforcement. So with that perspective, let me just jump into my uh, background in this area. Um, this is from our perspective, one of the dimensions of the global haven industry that uh, has exploded in the last uh, two decades, capital flight, human capital flight, taking the form of real surge and uh, international emigration, and the uh, complementary problem of people in uh, generally richer countries sending back uh, foreign payments to the home country and being charged an awful lot to do that through the established mechanisms like Western Union. Um, estimates for remittances are uh, limited, but uh, you know the official transfers that we see the balance of payments is somewhere now uh, north of $690 billion and growing. Um, we suspect that that figure is actually low, that it's closer to $900 billion because a lot of the remittances are still uh, off the books and in cash uh, format. So uh, they're not going through the, the established uh, intermediaries. But whatever the number is, it's at least five times all foreign aid, and most of it is being sent from rich countries to poor countries by very poor people. Um, my first presentation to this uh, uh, issue, uh, Larry, Larry Kotlikoff and I did a presentation in 2005 to Paul Wolfowitz, who was very briefly the president of the World Bank. Uh, he invited us down because he had written an editorial for the Wall Street Journal called Let's Make the World Bank a Bank. Uh, and basically suggesting that the World Bank had been talking about this issue since the 1980s about banking for the poor, but there were still about 3 billion people unbanked worldwide. 
most of the energy had gone into something called uh, uh, you know, sort of credit, uh, microcredits. But after 32 years of microcredit lending, we've had a grand total of 120 million people who had actually been able to obtain those loans. And at the same time, ordinary people were making payments using uh, all kinds of other mechanisms that were costly, especially cash. Uh, much more risky, it's hard to save, hard to keep track of, uh, and just didn't have the, uh, didn't make use of the technologies that were available. At that point, there was almost nothing uh, being done except to comment on the size and growth of the re remittance market. There were experiments underway in South Africa and Brazil in particular, and to some extent in Uganda, uh, but the technology of FinTech was just being uh, introduced in, in a very nascent form. And the official institutions were just learning about it. Uh, we did notice already though that remittances had already become a dominant factor in international aid. Uh, and here's a chart that shows just the growth of remittances over time. Uh, it was driven by a number of factors. I won't get into this. There's a lot of theory about the, the, the growth of emigration and uh, many factors responsible, but you know, this is an industry that was experienced dramatic growth, especially after 2000. Um, part of it was the fact that you had low skilled uh, workers in, uh, uh, in uh, poorer countries basically being left behind by their uh, relatively skilled uh, neighbors who were moving to the first world. In the, many cases, the figures for skilled labor emigrating were quite dramatic. Haiti, uh, we found 75% of anyone with a college degree was ending up working in the United States. So this is at the upper end of the echelon. These, these workers were all, and many of them were supporting families uh, uh, that they had left uh, behind to take these jobs. Um, at the same time, we other basic fact that was concerning us when we talked to Wolfowitz uh, was it just that the costs that the established institutions were levying on this uh, new traffic were astronomical compared to costs? And when the major players, Western Union, MoneyGram, Citibank, uh, you know, were charging upwards of 10 to 15 percent for uh, basic cash transfers. Those numbers have come down, and David will uh, educate us about what they are today, but they're still, I'd say, north of where they ought to be. Uh, but at that time, depending on the country, uh, you, you saw astronomical kind of extraction of surplus from uh, the poorest people on the planet working in first world countries. Uh, an experiment was being run with, in Uganda to sort of for domestic transfer payments using cell phones as an intermediary. And this kind of set an early stage experiment. Um, the bank Kinshasa was an early pioneer in this area. I like to call out these entrepreneurs. Uh, but at that point, we still had not yet launched uh, anything in like the services they, they launched in Kenya. In an odd way, it turned out to be advantageous uh, for countries to be a little bit backward when it came to payment systems and banking uh, for the purposes of adopting these payment systems, because uh, they could, you know, as soon as cell phones became prolifer prolific, uh, and they could serve as mobile wallets. Uh, you know, it, it turned out that uh, countries like Kenya and Uganda that had uh, relatively poor banking services for the poor uh, could very quickly develop a mass basis for those services uh, based on cell phones. Um, that's what we found in Haiti. I went there in 2011 after the earthquake. Um, at that time, we had Western Union was the dominant player. Uh, and uh, still is to some extent in conjunction with the local banks in Haiti, but Haiti is kind of a poster child for all of the uh, problems that we're describing here. Um, at the time of the earth earthquake, uh, uh, the, there was a tremendous flurry of interest on in the part of uh, Western donors uh, kind of briefly um, to get involved. And you had uh, also celebrities like Sean Penn showing up uh, Bill Gates went to Haiti with, with Bill Clinton. They partnered with a guy named Dennis O'Brien, who was the chairman of the local cell phone monopoly, uh, one of the do dominant players, Digicel. 
Uh, and Gates put up $7 million to finance uh, a system for basically having remittances being sent to cell phones. Uh, and they did a, a pretty good job initially giving people free cell phones, $25 on the cell phone. And not surprisingly, they soon had 250,000 Haitians who had taken these cell phones. The problem was that, and I think this is a kind of a general issue that I would put to the panel here, um, when you're developing some of these applications for poorer people, uh, it's very helpful to actually talk to them. And the key problem with the Microsoft, uh, Bill Gates, uh, Gates Foundation approach to this in company with Dennis O'Brien um, was that they never talked to a single Haitian about the development of the system. They simply introduced it, rolled it out, and after um, maybe two years, the system dried up because what they neglected to do was the fundamental thing of connecting merchants. So nobody could spend this stuff. It was electronic currency, but it was sitting on your phone. It didn't have any, any uses except to pay other people with those uh, cell phone accounts. So, uh, and it couldn't be accessed from abroad. So there were basically, there was a whole lot of learning to be done on the part of the software development industry when it comes to actually rolling out new technologies like FinTech. Um, basic facts about Haiti um, of, of the, uh, at, at that point we had, you know, very low per capita income, $706. About 2.2 million uh, Haitians lived outside of the country and to a great extent were supporting uh, the 10.5 million people who are living inside the company. So remittances as a share of GDP uh, was easily 24%. That's based on the official remittance figure. It's probably north of that. Um, and the GDP of the Haitians working in the United States, while they were you know, relatively low income in the US, from a Haitian standpoint, they were uh, very well off and able to support families. So this created this tremendous flow to the point where uh, official aid, exports, uh, other sources of foreign exchange were totally dominated in the case of Haiti uh, by the remittance inflows. And that's why it's such a strategic uh, issue of importance to get this right for poor people. That was my main, main concern about FinTech and, and hoping to get people to solve that problem. It doesn't look like we have solved it to this day, but. Uh, I'm hoping that David can explain more about that a little bit later. 73% um, was coming from the United States. There's also a variety of others, but having this solved in the United States, uh, you know, we're talking about a couple hundred bucks a month, uh, but thousands and thousands of these transactions going on, mainly from uh, places that you would expect like New York, New Jersey, uh, Florida. Uh, and the, Formal and remittances uh, had been growing steadily uh, throughout the uh, uh, 2000, uh, early 2000s and have continued to grow since then. Um, the key thing about the market for you know, these remittances was that it's dominated by a cartel. And you had uh, local banks like Unibank and Soga Bank, Soja Bank teaming up with Western Union to basically set prices in this market. Western Union had a network of something like 870 uh, local transfer points where people could get cash, uh, but there was very little price competition at this point. Um, that's changed to some extent, but still pretty much, you find this in many poorer countries that the local market is not that large enough to uh, attract the interest of, of major FinTech players. Um, and so there are still, uh, still quite a bit of, uh, uh, cartelization in these, in these uh, remittance markets. So there are three or four different hypotheses that I would come out of this experience with. Uh, first of all, there is an opportunity to sharply reduce transactions costs and improve service, grow the market, improve service, especially to uh, people in need. Um, I haven't talked about the problem of law enforcement and, and uh, that's a whole nother subject that we can get into in detail, but the issues that financial technology presents for uh, people who are trying to keep track of law money laundering are, you know, substan st substantial. 
Uh, and there are also other kinds of regulators like central banks that are concerned about undermining uh, you know, the market for their domestic currencies. You know, US dollar, but also China in particular, which is now regulating Bitcoin uh, uh, dramatically. Uh, I'm hoping we're able to talk about that. The last point, I think, uh, you know, we talked about the, the need to involve customers and regulators in the design process when you actually launch these services. Uh, as the Gates example showed, uh, couldn't have a better example of, of bad software design. Um, but the final point about whether incumbents are now going to, uh, you know, big banks, and other financial services players are now getting, you know, they, they started out by denouncing things like Bitcoin. And now it seems as if they're changing their attitudes and are uh, beginning to uh, be more positive. But exactly how you carve out uh, space for uh, major financial institutions that to some extent may be threatened by these technologies uh, is always a, a key question. So those are four questions that I would raise to our panel. Anyway, let me just go on now to David. And if you want to take it from there, um, if any students have questions, just uh, hold up your hands and using the, uh, the technology and we will uh, proceed. Great, thank you, Jim, and thanks everybody. Uh, this is David, please, everyone here, uh, feel free to interrupt and make this interactive. I do have some slides. Um, oh, Thomas, it looks like I'm not a co-host, actually, so I can't screen share. I will fix that. No problem, but um, guys, a little bit about me and, and sort of my personal journey getting into remittance and cross-border payments. Uh, Jim and I, during my World Bank tenure, spent some time in, in Haiti doing work uh, for the, the BRH, that's the Central Bank of Haiti. Uh, in particular, in, in those years, about 2014, 2015, financial inclusion, which has now basically gone mainstream and is a huge deal, uh, was still something, you know, mostly talked about in public policy circles. And so the World Bank was very, very involved there after the earthquake in, in 2010. Uh, you may remember there was uh, you know, just an enormous loss of life. Around 100,000 people were dead. Um, Haiti lost the equivalent of about a year's worth of GDP, you know, ended up by being the beneficiary of an enormous amount of international aid from both the US, uh, European Union, international organizations like the World Bank, but still nothing in Haiti managed to reach the scale of international remittances from overseas. And so I think that is particularly interesting here as we try to connect the dots and say like, what is this really all about? Um, so in, in, in an average year, Haiti's GDP is around $9 billion uh, of which maybe 2.2 to 2.4 billion comes from international remittances of Haitians living in the United States, France, and, and Canada. So, you know, one thing we like to talk about in our space is that, uh, you know, basically labor has become very mobile because you don't really need to be an immigrant anymore to leave a place like Haiti and go work in the United States. You can still basically be a member of the Haitian uh, you know, community and society and live in the US to work. So there's this distinction between migrants and immigrants that we, that we look at. And um, even though labor has become very mobile, uh, money hasn't become very mobile. And so as Jim was touched upon, it's very expensive to get funds into any country in particular for consumers. And there's another saying that, you know, it's basically expensive to be poor. And that plays out in a number of different ways here. But um, you know, to be very concise, there's around $700 billion that crosses borders every year from consumer to consumer. If you look at the broader international trade market, that's more like $20 trillion. But we're going to stick with consumer remittances for now. And there's been a, a kind of nice secular decline in the, in the price of remittance falling all the way from around 10% as recently as 2010, down to just under 7% today in the latest World Bank data, around 6.95% or so is the average cost. Uh, and so what that's usually the sum of a 
foreign exchange markup and then some kind of a flat fee. But let's just be clear here. This is really expensive. Um, and it's, it's, it's an industry that generates for the players, including certain banks who would kind of deign to be in this business uh, around $50 billion in annual recurring revenue. Okay. So back to Haiti, um, in, in even years as bad as the earthquake years, uh, Haiti would still not receive more than maybe 30% from international organizations and other donor governments, what they would get in remittances. So we're talking about 2.2 billion, uh, even in, you know, in, in a normal year, remittance was around four times the volume that Haiti would get from all the donors combined. So I, I have a, a memory that sticks out in my head. I don't think Jim was in this meeting, but we were there with the uh, central bank governor of Haiti, very nice man. Um, and he said, listen, you guys are so smart. Uh, if you think you're so smart and you're, you know, you're so arrogant with all your degrees and all your technical expertise, why don't you tell me why we have to pay you know, seven, eight percent to get money in when Haitians living in the United States send it and we don't have to pay any such fees when you give us money from the World Bank or these other kinds of organizations. And to be really honest with everyone here, we kind of sat there and scratched our heads and we were like, well, you know, there are some things we could try, but let us look into it and we'll, you know, we'll get back to you. And the truth is that uh, if you want to do a really rigorous cost accounting of why remittance is expensive, there are a number of different uh, factors here. And the, the, the global regulatory environment is really not a friend of uh, migrants trying to send money home. Compliance costs are very high. Uh, I can show a, a graphic here quickly. Let me just bring this up. So I think it's one second here. So everybody have a look at this. When, when we try to account for the 7% pricing that people are paying, uh, you have compliance accounting for about 13%. I think it's really more in reality. But the point on this is that when payment operators move money in this business, they need banking, right? Because payment companies are not banks. So they, they need a bank to custody the funds that they take in and pay out. And essentially, banks don't like to deal in this space because money that comes from consumers, money that comes in in cash is considered high risk. It's dirty. It could be used to buy drugs. It could be used for human trafficking. It could be used for plain vanilla money laundering. And it's something that's considered kind of a, a you know, redheaded stepchild of the financial services industry. So the cost of getting and uh, maintaining a bank account that would be used for this purpose is very, very high. And these companies have to undergo extremely rigorous anti-money laundering due diligence in order to be able to maintain such a bank account. And that's assuming they can maintain it at all. Because there's a phenomenon in this business of uh, de-risking, where the financial institutions that have given bank accounts to companies operating in the remittance space will call up the CEO or the compliance officer and say, hey guys, we've decided that we're shutting down your bank account. Uh, we don't have to give a reason. We always reserve the right to refuse to bank you and you need to find a new bank. So you know, as recently as probably two or three years ago at the UN annual conference on remittances, there was a lot of discussion about what global regulators could do to encourage um, banks to be just a little more friendly to these payment operators and stop cutting off their bank accounts. But the difficulty of accessing banking for these kinds of organizations drives the cost way up. It's very expensive to maintain bank accounts. Um, the second point is really the sort of financial plumbing. And I don't want to steal uh, Sandra's thunder. She's going to tell us a little bit about really exciting you know, infrastructure use cases for blockchain technology in global financial services. But you know, the, the way that foreign exchange is, is managed uh, in the cross-border payments industry is very inefficient. You know, typically, firms have to maintain pools of, of capital in you know, up to 100 or 200 currencies at once in order to manage their order book. So for example, if, if Jim wants to send uh, $100 from the US to Haiti and I'm Western Union, I need to keep a balance of Haitian gourds that I'm gonna use to service Jim's payment. And that's really very expensive because this means that my entire balance sheet is 
diversified in like a lot of different currencies and I'm exposed to certain risks if um, the currency depreciates. I also have to come up with the working capital to fund those bank accounts. So it's really pretty miserable, but um, let's pause on the technical stuff and just get back to Haiti. So, you know, the central bank governor said, you bureaucrats should be a little smarter and should really try to help us solve this problem. It's too expensive to get money into Haiti. And so we told them, listen, we'll look into it. And I confess, we tried a lot of different things. We proposed um, some new regulations that would be a kind of a price ceiling. We were shot down and we were told that, you know, the firms would just take their business elsewhere if we told them that, you know, they couldn't charge as much as they wanted to charge. And that's very important because, you know, this is a dynamic market. Uh, firms are making more money in other places. And Jim touched on the fact that in these kind of small markets, you know, it, it's so difficult to access certain countries that firms like Western Union might prefer to just service, for example, U.S. India volume because it's cheaper. Uh, they know how to do it. The risks of money laundering and fraud and terrorist finance are lower. And so they would say, forget it. So when you look at some of the really far flung geographies where migrants need to get money home, uh, the smaller and the more kind of you know, exotic the country is, usually the higher the costs are. So I'm gonna probably only speak another few minutes, but what my company has been working on is quite simply some new technology solutions to address the like massive inefficiency in this market. And what's interesting is, um, you know, I, I touched for a second on this like liquidity management problem where remittance firms need to own currency in a lot of different countries in order to manage their order book. So one of the cool things about blockchain technology is that um, if, it's, if it's rolled out in a way that uh, complies with the rules uh, both, you know, domestically and internationally, everything from the U.S. Treasury Department's really tough regulations to the domestic standards, wherever you're sending money, you can you can use the blockchain to really reduce the operating costs to manage liquidity. And so, a, a major way that we would do that is by taking out this pre-funding expense that drives up costs and is kind of a big deal. Um, so, my business was one of the first to partner with uh, Ripple Labs. You may have heard they are currently involved in an SEC lawsuit. Uh, I would just tell the class it's unrelated to their payments activities and is more on the security side. But to be concrete, uh, SendFriend, we're currently involved in sending money from the US to the Philippines. Um, we can do that at about maybe 20 to 30% the cost of some of our competitors. This is a chart we made uh, last August it's really quite astounding what you can do if you cut the banks out of the equation. You know, that they, they just take such an enormous amount of margin out of these payments for themselves. And it's been one of the best kept secrets in the financial services world for a long time. In fact, the, uh, if you look at Bank of America's 10Ks from, I think, 2019, the, their uh, FX and payments business was the most profitable one in the bank. And, you know, I mean, people typically think of investment banking or, you know, trading, but this is just purely transactional stuff. It's the most profitable business in the bank. So, you know, if you have a look here, um, you can see, like, at least when this data was current, I, I have to update it. But we were just about 30% the expense of using Western Union for cash. But, you know, there's still a lot of complexity here that keeps prices high. One of the really important points um, that Jim touched on is that most migrants that are sending money home, even if they have a bank account in the United States and are capable of initiating payment online, their family members most likely do not have bank accounts overseas. And so the kind of Gates model where you've got people receiving money into a digital wallet on, on a cell phone, you know, doesn't always work well. We have kind of success stories like Kenya, where the mobile money network is very robust and people can kind of find an off ramp to spend the credits they have on their cell phone. But in most countries, that's simply not the case. And if you have your, your, your funds tied up in a cell phone, you need to get paper currency in order to spend them. Um, India has made enormous strides with their UPI model. Uh, China has done the same with Alipay. 
But a lot of the other big remittance receiving countries like Nigeria, Philippines are just way behind on this. And so one of the things that really holds back um, reducing costs in the sector is that you still need to get the recipients cash every time. So uh, before I wrap up, I would just add, you know, we're still a, a really long way away from what we'd all consider in the kind of global, uh, you know, policy community to be a decent price for sending remittances. And in the sustainable development goal number 10 on inequality, there's a target to get the cost of remittances to 3% or lower by 2030. Uh, we're now at 7%, but we're still really a ways off. And I think that there's been fabulous uh, increases in competition and in digitization, which have put pressure uh, downward on prices. We're seeing some really good things happen. I mean, the, the coronavirus pandemic was really good for um, the cost of remittances because it forced a lot of people that ordinarily would send funds in cash to learn how to do it online. And so the digital remittance space actually doubled in volumes in 2020. So that was one of the silver linings. Um, and we're kind of expecting that trend to continue and hope that the space will be around 50% digital by the time uh, like 2025 comes. But at the moment, it's, it's still only about 25% of remittances that originate online. And this is mostly a cash to cash business off the books, like Jim said. And uh, that, that presence of cash in the flow of funds drives costs up and increases the compliance risk for operators to handle these funds. So, you know, I'll just conclude by saying it's a long, it's a long slog before we get to the 3% future, but everyone is really working hard in the space. And there's some fantastic innovation happening um, on the sort of plumbing and infrastructure side of things, which Sandra is going to talk to us about. So let me pause there and see if there are any questions. Um, thanks. Right. Questions for David from anyone. Harrison, Sandra is uh, in deck on deck. Um, yes, Harrison has a question. Hi. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks, David. Um, I have a question about investment in the Perhaps, perhaps not only in the remittance space, but in like the fintech focused on emerging markets and low income economy space, because there's obviously an unbelievable amount of like venture capital and uh, private equity investment in fintech in in the UK and Europe and in the mm -hmm. US. But like um, how 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 much money is flowing into technologies that's, that are actually going to make a real difference, you know, like you like technologies like like SendFriend and, and, and the like, um, rather than perhaps the less risky technology, uh, you know, like another neobank in, in the US? Yeah, I know. I think that's a great question. I mean, if you, I don't have any data in front of me, but venture investment in emerging markets in general, and not just in financial services has been historically really anemic. Right. I mean, when you look at the kinds of uh, investments that are being made in places like the Philippines, with which I'm pretty familiar, you get Chinese money flowing in from Tencent, Alibaba to trying to develop the mobile wallet ecosystem. But that's at a big like corporate scale. And so that you kind of price out a lot of the innovators that would want to bring, you know, cool, more entrepreneurial technologies into the market. Um, but I'm, I'm certain that the emerging markets VC ecosystem is really underfunded. I know that just my company having an international dimension made American investors less likely to want to invest in it. But one uh, silver lining is that, you know, I'm noticing a major kind of anecdotal interest in uh, African startups. You know, Y Combinator is accepting a lot of different African companies. And I know Jeff Bezos just put his own personal money into an African one called um, Chipper Cash, which is exciting. You know, Flutter Wave, the African uh, payment provider, just became a unicorn about two weeks ago after its Series C offering. So th I think there's totally signs of life, but certainly like US and UK investors need to learn the sector a little bit better before they get comfortable investing cross-border uh, in some of these geographies. 
Yeah, but could I ask you to introduce Sandra? And, uh, you know, I, I gave her a very cursory introduction. I want, want her Absolutely. to feel Sandra, welcome and uh, welcome uh, from all of us. But uh, Super. So, um, everybody, I, I want to introduce Sandra Rowe, who is the CEO of the Global Blockchain Business Council. Uh, she's been a, a supporter and, and board member to SendFriend for, like, I think, three years now. Uh, she's extremely, extremely knowledgeable. We're lucky to have her as a you know, a current, very current practitioner in the space. The GBBC is probably the best recognized trade association in the blockchain industry. Uh, it's backed by people like Richard Branson. They have, you know, 200 some members in 70 different countries. And um, Sandra is a veteran of the Chicago Mercantile Exchange and Morgan Stanley. She spent a lot of her career structuring derivatives. She also happens to be a Yaley. So um, I'm sure you know, we're lucky to have her here today for, for all of you guys. Great. Thank you, Dave. Sandra, over to you. All right. Well, thank you, uh, first of all, David, James, Professor Pogi. Thank you very much for having me. Um, everyone can hear me okay, I hope. So I'm going to just uh, lay out sort of where we sit, and I'm going to talk predominantly about the U.S. landscape, only because the U.S. has had a tremendous amount of activity in the last six months. But I will touch upon global trends as well with respect to blockchain, digital assets, and cryptocurrencies. I try to do all of this within um, about 20 minutes or so. So I'm going to share my screen um, because I did send around a document that I was hoping you may be able to take a look at, but I'll share that here. It's an overview we did very recently. Um, we had a private roundtable with about um, 15 pension funds very recently. And when I mean very recently, um, last week. And uh, these were predominantly US pension funds, but we did actually have a few out of um, South Africa and Europe as well. And we were talking about predominantly the landscape. And um, I think some of the insights here hopefully will be helpful to you. Uh, and this again covers the last six months. Um, now we are seeing some big numbers. And I've been in this space for about a decade, which makes me a total old timer in crypto world. Um, I started looking at Bitcoin back in 2011, 12, and frankly started really looking at it from a technology standpoint, not from a speculative price standpoint. And the fact that you could actually have potentially alternative plumbing in the financial services sector. And if you do build out this alternative plumbing and it actually works, and of course we started with Bitcoin and now we've got much more, um, what does that mean for the world? And for me, that is what drove my curiosity and my time looking at this space. And the more I spend time looking at this space and working in it now, 100% of my time, I am convinced that we are seeing tectonic paradigm shifts across not only what is money, what is value in the form of data, what is ownership, who owns it, and who controls the rails of that. Um, there are many different geopolitical, legal, regulatory, and also technology-driven um, convergence going on at the moment. And then layer in the pandemic, and we see, we've seen an acceleration of some of that within the digital economy. So here are some numbers for you. Um, this is from largely PwC, Accenture, the World Economic Forum, uh, PayPal, Facebook, a number of other sources that are listed here. Um, we're seeing a massive growth in this industry uh, without a doubt. Now the question is, are we looking at multi-decades of evolution? I would argue yes, even though we've already had a decade of a Bitcoin evolution and then obviously other blockchains um, having been created, we're just at the beginning of a multi multi year evolution in across blockchain. I think it's PwC that expects $4.3 billion to actually be spent on blockchain alone. Or though, sorry, it was 4.3 billion in blockchain alone spending in 2020. And they expect that number to go up uh, to 1.76 trillion over the next decade. These are big numbers that we're now finally looking at. 
And I'm going to divide the world into a couple different segments. And again, I'm just going to focus on financial services to start, but we could talk about any other industry because most industries are being impacted now at varying degrees. So we had David focus a lot of discussion around cross-border remittance. And absolutely, there's a lot happening on the retail payment side. Uh, cross-border remittance also being a major thematic, but we're also seeing a lot of activity on the trading and digital wallet side. And this is important because what you're thinking of as digital wallets today is actually your gateway in the way you're going to inter interact in the future digital world. And what does that mean? It means your digital identity will most likely be a linked with your digital wallet. And that digital wallet that moves money around today in a digital world will actually take on many other attributes that we're only just beginning to scratch the surface of. I was sitting at a World Economic Forum um, uh, round table today, closed door with a number of practitioners in the space this morning. And we've been largely talking about that and what that will look like in the future because we think it's gonna be one of the most important things to get right in order for the world to have a set of rails that are um, fair, equitable, and accessible. And if we don't get it right, and we mess it up, and we have three or four large behemoths that control it, we're going to have issues um, similar to what we have today. But I just wanna highlight, and I'm not gonna go through all of these, but you've got some brand names like Visa has launched something called First Boulevard, which is really focusing on um, black community and creating this native neobank. And this sounds all kind of like futuristic, but it's happening today. And I think you know you should keep your eye out for very much Fortune 500 brand names actually getting into crypto now, getting into low, uh, announcing their own tokens, um, coming up with their own digital wallets. What does that mean? A lot of this impacts retail. I mean, PayPal alone, just so you guys know, has over 300 and I think 25 million uh, active users. And that means, and they're also going to allow their merchants, which are about 29 million merchants worldwide to have access to be able to take crypto in. That's a big deal. That is what you call mainstream adoption now because you've got a major player that is offering it. Uh, MasterCard's also saying that they're preparing to do so. Um, these are not, you know, these are household names. And so we're beginning to see this crossover between something that was very much fringe to now accessible to um, people, at least the average person probably in this sort of uh, well-educated uh, developed nation demographic. And many of you might know, I'm gonna skip over some of these other ones. Um, Coinbase is about to go public. Just to give you a sense of the size of Coinbase, um, the largest exchange in the US is probably CME Group, which is my former employer at about 70 billion uh, market cap. They're going to come in around that, if not higher, on their in their IPO on April 14th. And that will probably make them the largest uh, quote unquote exchange in the US, bigger than NASDAQ, bigger than New York Stock Exchange ICE. Just think about that for a moment. Um, it's a pretty big deal. So again, you're beginning to see new entrants, new names like Coinbase become the Fortune 500s of tomorrow. Um, but then you also have on the commercial, I'm gonna switch over to the commercial and wholesale banking side now. You've got a lot of activity with the banks and I know a lot of people like to kind of trash the banks and say, oh, they don't, you know, they're not innovating. They're not really doing anything. I, I'd be careful to say that because we work with a lot of the banks and they are. They are, they are working in sort of different areas though. They may not be focusing so much on retail, they're actually focusing on the wholesale and commercial banking side. And that's significant too, because there's a lot of areas in capital markets, in lending, in collateralization, in risk management, that frankly, uh, there's a lot of low hanging fruit to um, become more efficient, to utilize blockchain, to help um, remove frictions and costs, but also new revenue lines for some of these folks. And so you got a lot of these big names working on different aspects and um, I'm not gonna go through all of them, but I'm gonna actually mention BNY Mellon. BNY Mellon being the largest custody holder with trillions and trillions of assets under management has now said that they will allow and hold transfer and issue Bitcoin and other crypto on behalf of its asset management clients. This is a big deal. They are about as conservative as you get as a bank a custody bank and for them to actually make an announcement like this and I just spoke to the head of blockchain over at BNY Mellon he's been in the space for a while um, apparently they have some more announcements coming out 
they are they are moving in a big way. And um, market infrastructure, those are the trading platforms um, that you know, you know, many of you've seen and heard and trade on probably. Um, CME Group, which is where I was, you know, my team is the one that created the CME Bitcoin reference rate and the in the index products, as well as the futures, which was the um, the follow-on product uh, that has 2.5 billion of open interest today. That futures contract, when I first floated the idea to internally, people thought we were insane. Um, this was back in 2015. It wasn't all that long ago, but it's taken you know a number just a few years for now it to become a two and a half billion dollar um, open interest futures contract that's trading and growing every single um, month on month. And uh, they just actually introduced Ethereum futures or Ether futures in February. So those products can, um, are, are growing. And by the way, from a regulated derivative standpoint, these are pretty much the only regulated derivatives contracts that are out there regulated by, um, well, CME is regulated by the CFTC. Uh, NASDAQ, uh, ICE, as I mentioned, they all have different varieties of activity going on. Um, on the investment side, this is where the biggest change has actually happened in the last six months. And it's really taken a lot of people by surprise, uh, but it shouldn't actually. A lot of this was percolating for quite some time. So you've heard about Tesla, you've heard about probably Square purchased a couple hundred million dollars worth. MicroStrategy has also announced that they've purchased even more very recently. Um, they've got well over a billion, they probably have a billion and a half now. Um, Mass Mutual is a name actually that I found really interesting, and BlackRock. These are names that are stalwarts in the asset management um, community. And for them to actually step forward and say they're starting to leg in, even if they're go only going in a half a percent or a percent, it's significant. Um, and so you're beginning to see this crossover again. These are brand names. These are not folks who don't do their homework. They absolutely do their homework and then decide to diversify. Um, so it's adding a lot of interesting um, conversation to dynamics. And also Yale's name's been thrown in as well as an endowment um, that has also dipped their toes in. So, you know, Yale's also been um, mentioned a few times around uh, under the leadership, obviously, of David Swenson. Uh, regulation, we're going to get a new head of OCC. Even though this information is really from um, the last few months and under um, the uh, previous OCC head, uh, Brian Brooks, uh, the anticipation is actually that the new OCC head is probably going to be less crypto friendly, and we may see um, some movement on some of the initial indicative guidance. So a lot of people are waiting to find out who the head of OCC will be. Uh, we're also seeing also um, FinCEN just, I believe, announced, um, or at least uh, I think there was a very recent announcement yesterday who the new FinCEN head will be. It's a former Chainalysis executive. So that means um, that person's very well equipped and knowledgeable around um, crypto, which is a good thing. So let's see what happens there. SEC, um, obviously Gensler is proposed to be the chair if he does get confirmed. Another person who knows absolutely a ton about crypto and frankly will be in good position to um, opine on a number of the open items where people are asking for legal clarity, particularly from a security standpoint. And then New York, you've got New York DFS, who uh, we work with very closely and I sit on the New York uh, digital currency, New York State's digital currency task force and I represent the Senate side. Um, there is a report that is meant to be due by the end of December, but because of the pandemic and also different budgetary issues, I do have a feeling I'm waiting for the budget to be finalized. I have a feeling they're going to kick the can down the road with regards to the report, but we're meant to produce a uh, cryptocurrency report by the end of December this year. I have a feeling it's going to be next year, but um, we'll be looking to do that, working with the legislators on how New York State We'll be looking at uh, crypto and blockchain digital assets. Um, there's a lot of active bills out there. The top states, I will say for y'all to look at, Wyoming, New York, because obviously it's importance in financial services. Um, Texas is doing some interesting things, but I still think Texas is TBD. Um, California is obviously important from its own um, sort of, you know, it's an economic engine. But I think one that people tend to uh, ignore, which they shouldn't, is Illinois. 
from a trading perspective, Illinois is the hub of high frequency trading. And so if there's any interesting um, you know, laws coming out of Illinois, the high frequency traders are gonna be watching that and also the futures traders. I'm gonna just- over, oh, go Can I ask you just to focus on some of the key regulatory issues that you see here? Uh, if you step back from all the, the fray of the various institutions, it's extraordinarily complicated, even the US to figure yes. out who's who's doing what. I mean, the OCC, how they relate to FinCEN, and this is all kind of murky to the, and certainly to murky to me, but uh, maybe you can give us some perspective on who's gonna be basically calling the, the shots from the standpoint of US national strategy. Is it something that the private sector is going to be leading the way on um, just, you know, how do we, how do we make this happen more effectively? Yeah, that's the million dollar question. Um, the U S is the largest wallet share in the world. And therefore, even if you're in Asia, you're still looking at the U S and what's the U S going to do. This is why it matters for the U S to actually message out some clarity around, uh, its regulatory stance. So we've got a couple different issues. You've got, uh, four different definitions of crypto at the moment. You've got, uh, SEC says it's a security in certain instances. Uh, the CFTC says that it is a commodity. You've got um, IRS that has deemed it as property. And then you've got the likes of OCC and FinCEN that have said it's like a currency. Um, it really can't be all four. And uh, what we're also seeing at the federal level is a bit of turf war. Uh, and there's actually been accusations and declarations that there's been overreach. And I'll give you one example. And this is coming from the CFTC commissioner, uh, Dawn Stump, and she actually released this very publicly. So Coinbase was accused of, um, you know, some uh, violations back in 2016, I believe. This is a while back. They cleaned it up uh, and they settled with the CFTC. It's all public information. $6.5 million fine that they paid. It's really a slap on the risk for Coinbase. And I'm sure they were cleaning up their you know, outstanding um, issues mm -hmm. with any regulators ahead of their IPO. The interesting thing that Dawn Stump said was actually that she agreed that Coinbase was guilty. Mm -hmm. However, of wrongdoing, however, she specified that the CFTC's mandate is to regulate the derivatives industry and not the underlying cash, which is true. They do not actually, spot markets, they do not regulate and have the mandate to oversee and um, uh, enforce uh, the, the spot markets. And it was interesting that she objected to that basic overreach in her view because CF he said that the CFTC cannot do this because Coinbase does not have any derivative products and they actually operate in the spot markets in crypto. And that was an interesting distinction. So we're beginning to see some commissioners come out and saying there's overreach happening. Um, at a more fundamental level, the US Treasury is very important. And we're spending a lot of time also behind closed doors talking to US Treasury, especially with Janet Yellen now in charge. There's entirely new staff. OCC falls underneath the treasury. For those of you who are interested, you should take a look at all the entities under treasury. There are a lot and um, wide reaching. Exactly. Yep. And, then, and then one more thing, if I may layer on, is the state level. This is what makes the US so interesting is you now have some states who have literally provided that clarity or in, in at least addressed a lot of these issues at the state level. So Wyoming is your sort of golden standard and we work a lot with the Wyoming folks. Um, this is their goal and it's simply this. For most people who know, Delaware is where you incorporate your ink or your LLC and it's super easy to do so. Why? Because they've streamlined the process for incorporating an LLC or an ink as a US entity. They want to do that for the crypto blockchain world. And you don't need to live there. But if you want to set up a crypto company or any kind of blockchain company, they want you to come to Wyoming and set up shop there because they've made the laws clear. They've made it super friendly and they're welcoming all that type of business. Is there a, 
is there a brain that's driving this in Wyoming? Because they've been uh, on the cutting edge of LLCs and uh, asset yes. protection trusts for some time. It goes back to the late yeah. 80s. Um, who, um, who, who's the thought so, leader? Is it the Cheney family? <laughs> So. It's, a, it's actually a good friend and former Morgan Stanley executive. Her name is Caitlin Long. Mm -hmm. Caitlin Long is now the CEO and founder of Avanti Bank, mm. which is incorporated in Wyoming, of course. It is a, a crypto bank, and they are uh, really pioneering and trailblazing uh, as sort of a next generation bank. What on um, earth is a crypto bank? One on earth is a crypto bank. Yeah, they, basic, will be basic. One for, they will be one for one um, utilizing a token called uh, Avit, A-V-A-T. It's their token. And they'll be allowing for a settlement, but they're one for one. They will not be doing any kind of um, rehypothecation. There'll be no frag fragmenting of their um, deposit. So they're a deposit bank. They will just take deposits in and they will settle very efficiently um, and, and, and kind of remove some of the frictions that you get with um, time lags and you know, pre-funding um, collateralization issues because they are literally going to only be a deposit bank. They will not be doing loans. They will not be doing any kind of, but they will allow for the on-ramping and off-ramping of dollars to crypto and crypto to dollars. I think starting with Bitcoin. And that's been one of the challenges of the crypto industry is the traditional banks have often pulled the plug on crypto businesses. It's been very difficult to keep a bank account, a traditional bank account, because of just, you know, frictions. Um, a lot of banks still do not want to open, allow a, a crypto business to have a bank account. And so this bank will be solving for that. But if you want to know who else has been, who actually wrote the laws, it's actually Chris Lands and Tyler Lindholm, who are now staff with Senator Lummis in DC. But Chris Lands is actually the one who wrote a lot of those laws, or sorry, bills that then became law. Well, I've got a ton of questions, but let's ask the students if they wanna uh, contribute to this. I, I saw some uh, hands raised before. And call. I see Enzo. Enzo. Thank you so much for the presentation. So my question is about you know, the future of fiat money and where we're headed with, with crypto. So assuming that we accept the definition of crypto as a, as a currency, because you gave us different definitions, what sort of macroeconomic effects um, should we expect and should governments and central banks expect if they can no longer, say, print money to control something like inflation? Yeah, um, this is the uh, raging debate at the moment and why you may have seen this concept of central bank digital currency explode. So we have three different buckets um, kind of to deal with. So there's the central bank digital currency, which is basically the digital version of a sovereign fiat currency. You have stable coins, which I haven't even introduced yet as a real topic, but think of stable coins as usually backed uh, one for one with dollar, for example, to help, again, do the on-ramp, off-ramp. Avit would be an example of a, of a token stable coin, um, usually privately issued. And then you've got cryptocurrencies like Bitcoin and Ether, which have, uh, which really came from grassroots, right? There's no real like um, owner of Bitcoin or crypto in, in the sense of a sovereign entity or a private company. Um, with these three different buckets of value, um, I think where governments are racing to launch their own CBDCs is because they're, some of them are solving for very specific problems with their, in their own countries to help you know, remove frictions or, or help maybe access with financial services. And some of these are very noble and good reasons. But I think some are actually racing to um, launch CBDCs because they see and are worried about the rise of these crypto and stable coins. And um, I'll be very frank with you, between Bank for International Settlements, which is BIS, um, uh, the World Economic Forum, the OECD, the G20, it is on every single major entity's mind um, and central banker's mind now 
about how they're going to deal with that. And I don't have an easy answer for you because frankly, I think there is a um, definite tension in, in the world right now of this sort of like group of people and frankly, grassroots movement that no one really noticed, but now it's become a $2 trillion market cap you know, um, value in the last couple months alone. I don't know if you guys know this, but crypto and stable coins have increased in value from 1 trillion to 2 trillion just this year. That's one quarter. That is significant. I was absolutely amazed at, especially after the election, it went, uh, Bitcoin uh, went from 600 billion to north of a trillion. And crypto yeah. as, a, as a whole went uh, close to 2 trillion. It's it sort of wavered in the last six weeks, but um, yeah. you know, I guess from that standpoint, one more question I'll permit myself is just what are central banks going to do about this? I mean, can they really tolerate the existence of an anonymous global digital currency that is not backed by them and regulated by them? Uh, how do they view this as a, as a so, threat? <laughs> so just so, um, and I should have explained this earlier, guys, but the GBBC was actually formed by a group of entrepreneurs to do exactly what was happening now, which is to try to unpack for central bankers, regulators, government officials, executives of some of the biggest companies, what's going on and try to prevent them from panicking and just trying to put the kibosh on the whole thing. Because the easiest thing you could do as in a government is just to ban it, just say it's banned. Um, but the problem is it tends to go dark and it goes to other markets and then you can't have any oversight of it. That's not our what we tend to um, advise. What we advise is actually to look at um, the current state of your country's, you know, monetary policy. To look at what Bitcoin or what the usages are may or may not be in your country. For a lot of people, Bitcoin is actually a store of value more akin to gold than actually a currency for usage. And I know that sounds a bit oxymoronic considering it was actually created to be used as currency, but the form that it's really taking is actually a store of value. So people are thinking of it as an alternative in a world where we've got central banks printing money and debt that looks like it's spiraling out of control um, as an alternative to place value. So in many cases, Bitcoin itself has a unique um, set of attributes. Now, when it comes to the stable coins and some of these privately issued tokens, there is concern that all of a sudden if, and, and really, if you guys look at Facebook, they really triggered it. Facebook's announcement of Libra, I will literally, I think the history books will look back on this and say that was the moment that central bankers woke up because they realized 2.3 billion people in the Facebook network could possibly all be issued digital wallets overnight and then have access to something called Libra, which is now called Diem. Um, and what happens there? Even Harris, if that project failed. Oh, sorry, go ahead. I was just gonna get a question from Harrison. He's been waiting a while, but I, I, I take your point that uh, the Libra thing was phenomenal. Uh, and, 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 yeah. and, and pretty club, club footed, what, wasn't it? A little bit on Facebook? Yes. Channel? I mean, how yes. It will be, I think, a business use case study on the absolute wrong way to announce any project. Yeah, a Swiss-based company. <laughs> so, anyway, uh, Harrison. Yes. Harrison, Harrison, I think you're mute. Hi, hi. Sorry, my internet's bad. Um, thank you so much for for speaking for speaking to us. Um, I, my my question is not specific to cryptocurrencies, but more to the blockchain technology in general. And, you know, the yep. other thing that's just on everyone's um, tongue at the moment is, is NFTs. And I wonder if you, we've been speaking a lot in this class about uh, taxation and problems with taxation globally and so on. And I wonder if you can speak, you know, perhaps on, on a very, on the very broad level around, oh, here we, here we are. Yeah. Like around how, how just blockchain and tokenized uh, networks are going to be used to change the way we um, or yeah. to improve financial integrity, you know, the same as class. 
Yeah, no, you actually have uh, uh, highlighted something very important, which most people, the average person is not getting right now on NFTs. So first of all, NFTs have been around for like five, six plus years. No one cared. Crypto kitties came. And I don't even know if you guys have seen a crypto kitty. It's the ugliest like cartoon cat. But that clogged up the Ethereum network a few years ago. That was your version 1.0 of an NFT. And then that had a huge hype cycle. It died. No one cared about it for a while. And then all of a sudden, in the last few months, you had Dapper Labs, the creators of CryptoKitties, by the way, who inked a deal with NBA. NBA Top Shop was launched. And then all of a sudden, you've got just this it, tremendous amount of hype and, and, frankly, real value being moved into um, NFTs. So the uniqueness of an NFT, think of it this way. It's a unique digital object in a digital economy that is completely the opposite of a cryptocurrency because a cryptocurrency you can use for pretty much anything and it's fungible. An NFT is unique. And because it's unique, um, it can't be actually mixed up with anything else. It, it stands on its own. So that unique object that you own is all of a sudden potentially something valuable and something you can trade. Now, here's the thing, and, and the attributes are listed here. It's unique, it's scarce, ideally, and it's supposed to be indivisible, though people are talking about splitting up NFTs right now, which is a, actually another entire Pandora's box of issues around re from a regulatory perspective. Um, but the thing that I think you guys should be aware is this is like, think of this as like version 1.1. We have other versions coming of NFT that relate to any asset, and it's not just real estate, it's not just financial services, it's going to actually be many, many other things. We're gonna see iterations of this. We're gonna move beyond art. We're gonna move beyond um, uh, you know, some of these like um, collectibles at the moment that people are trading in. It's gonna actually start spilling into the institutional world from a financial services standpoint. And that's where there's some really potentially uh, interesting things that are going to happen. And I think when to hit capital markets in a way uh, where financial services, uh, sorry, financial products are NFTs, that's gonna be interesting. And I can't even begin to tell you what that looks like yet, because we're not there. But people are talking about land titling, people are talking about um, fractionalizing real estate again. That was also in vogue a couple of years ago. So you often find that like some of these trends they kind of lose momentum, but then another version of it comes back a few years later. And so I think you're going to see NFTs have already kind of like started dipping down now. I think we hit the hype cycle, probably with that $69 million sale. Um, but what you're going to see is another, another iteration of this as it hits the low and it comes back, there will be more advancements because at its core, it's actually a very valuable concept. I hope that makes sense. Great. Let me turn to my um, law enforcement colleagues who are always going to look at some of these things as scary. <laughs> so I don't know if uh, Andres in Stuttgart um, or Ross Gaffney um, or any of the other students here uh, want to ask a question about what are the things we have to be worried about from the standpoint of either fraud or um, you know, the money laundering, some of the downsides. And Sandra, let me ask you to speculate on, on you know, are there legitimate concerns we have to have? Is there a need for some degree of regulation? Yeah. If anyone has any questions or comments, please um, chime in. But I do want to show you one thing to go to as a free resource. This is the Global um, Business Council's uh, website. It's our Global Standards Mapping Initiative. We mapped 185 jurisdictions last year with the World Economic Forum and many partners. We have literally taken every major country that had any kind of announcement on digital assets, crypto, blockchain, you name it. If we could find it, we put it here all in one place. You click on uh, United States, for example, and you can click on every single entity that may have issued something. And if they have, we've put it here together in one place. Eventually, in the next version, you'll be able to do search functions and like cool reporting. But it took us many, many people working across many different um, around the world to actually map all of these different entities and just as a bonus for the US. And we do cover many other countries. Um, 
If you look down here, if you go to North America, I believe, um, United States of America, I do believe we've actually, sorry, hold on one second. We actually mapped out 49 states and here's a bonus, uh, oh, US by state, here you are. Um, here's the other uh, quiz I always give everyone. What's the one state that has zero um, laws or any kind of guidance around blockchain or Mon Bitcoin or Montana? crypto? Montana, is it Montana? No, it's one that's in gold right here. Oh, no kidding, Mississippi, Mississippi. wonderful. Every state, 49 states in the United States actually have some sort of guidance or bill or some mention of crypto or digital assets in there. Um, you know, and you can, if you're really into it, you can go and click on all of these. So there's information for you. Hmm. Yeah, there's a lot for us to be concerned about. Um, and I don't, I didn't even talk to about DeFi and DeFi is one area, decentralized finance is one area where mm -hmm. I am both fascinated and also very concerned. And this is something that just happened this weekend. And this is too common of an occurrence. Um, I am in discussion with a number of regulators about this uh, behind the scenes, because I do think we're regulators do need to step in before we have another ICO um, crypto winter situation um, happening around the world. So just to give you guys a short version of what happened this weekend, $1.3 billion was raised within hours. How did that happen? And what was it for? There's something called FEI protocol and you guys can look it up, FEI protocol. It is a decentralized algorithmic stable coin. <laughs> what does that even mean? Yeah. It means that it is a new token that has a function where they're apparently one for one with US dollar and it has uh, built in algo uh, mechanisms where smart contracts have different incentives uh, in order to keep that one for one balance. Sounds good, doesn't it? Yes, it does. Well, we have something called crypto whales, and these are big traders. And these are people who've already made billions off of Bitcoin. They came in, bought a bunch of this stuff very early on because they heard about it before anyone else did because there's all these chat groups. It's very similar to inside, well, I'm not gonna call it insider trading, it's not. It's just advanced information and the stuff is not regulated. So you can't call it illegal because it's not insider information. It's just passed around chat groups and people find out about it because you're in that group. A bunch of people bought it. It started trading and all of a sudden it dropped 95 cents on the dollar. Okay, well, let's say you wanna sell it. Here's the problem, this algo has a penalty. It's called the burn penalty. That means it's trading below par and therefore you're not incentivized to sell it. Well, that burn rate was 30%. So even though on the screen, you saw 95 to a dollar, you thought, okay, well, at least I'm gonna sell it for 95 cents on the dollar. I'll take a small loss. No, no, it was 35 cents loss on the dollar. So you only got 65. This is the problem with um, these kind of sort of unregulated, un sort of, and I'm giving you the short version. It's much more nuanced than what I'm explaining, but 1.3 billion got raised. The whales, because there's no lockup period, got out and they all made a killing. Who got hurt? Well, a lot of people on crypto Twitter right now are clamoring and, and, and complaining that retail got hurt. I don't know that for a fact because I'd have to go and look. But this is a problem to me because the numbers are getting bigger and bigger. It used to be like people would raise 5 million bucks and people would be like, oh my gosh, that was a lot of money. That's no longer the case. People are raising billions now. And what are regulators going to do about this? And to me, this is just one example of many more that are coming. Great example. Um, I guess, you know, the conventional wisdom is that the people that are playing these games are basically people who don't really deserve much sympathy. I mean, this is sort of, a, you know, if you were into speculating on tulip bulb, bulbs in, this, in the 17th century, you'd probably feel you know, the same way. Uh, is that the case or do we have, I mean, is there any sense in which we need to be concerned legitimately uh, with, with the victims here? Um, 
Aren't they, um, aren't they, aren't they all basically uh, similar to <laughs> sort of players or, or is there a real whale, non-whale split? Um, if you go to YouTube, you go to Facebook and you see some of the shenanigans that are being pumped um, mm -hmm. to average people, I have a problem with that. And if I could add something, I mean, to give a little context, the subject of the Ripple SEC lawsuit is $1.3 billion that they raised from retail investors over probably 10 years. Mm -hmm. And so in Sandra's example, they raised that those funds in how long? Like a couple of days? A couple of days. Wow. Jesus. All right. Interesting. Well, I... Let's let's let you conclude with a couple observations. I'm, I think we can still come back and ask questions, but uh, I want to turn uh, briefly to quickly to uh, Francis. It's very late in Kenya, and I'm, I'm aware of his. Uh, <laughs> we're, we're keeping him up, uh, but uh, Sandra, just conclude with a, a couple of, um, sort of summary uh, messages sure. you want us to take away from this. I think it was an excellent so, presentation. There's a lot to digest. So I focused on financial services, which is where a lot of this started. But I, I'm going to give you kind of a, a final word on a more positive um, element of, of blockchain technology and, and tokenization and digitization. Um, we're seeing now for the first time a technology that requires collaboration. Um, companies just can't build it and then tell everyone, well, use it because I built it. That mentality doesn't work in blockchain. Um, this utility, community, grassroots um, focused collaboration type culture is the bedrock of blockchain technology. So you're, you're beginning to see even banks, even governments and private sector, uh, even some of the biggest tech companies in the world actually realizing that the collaboration is needed. And that's a good thing. So that's for one. Um, the other one is a more geopolitical comment, which is um, the U.S. is still the largest wallet share because of its, um, you know, status as a financial services behemoth. But that's eroding. And I think the U.S., if it's not careful, will lose that status over time because what you're seeing now is the innovations coming out of different parts of Asia are really trumping what's coming out of the US. And I don't mean from a necessarily just a private sector standpoint, because I think private sector of the US is still very strong in leading the path. It's really a combination of private sector and government out of places like China and India and Southeast Asia that are really starting to ramp up. And I think it's remiss to think that they're not going to actually play a significant role in um, challenging uh, the sort of U.S. you know leadership across technology and financial markets, et cetera, et cetera. So something to just be aware. David Alvarez had a question for you, I believe. David, are you still there? Uh, yes, uh, it's related to you and to and to David. In it's more related to the to a question probably of the remittance and how this can impact on at the street level. Because for instance, the example of Haiti was perfect because uh, well it was very clear in in the volume, but also you were talking about goods. But actually, many of these countries are in current currency wise are multilingual. For instance, in Haiti, you use goods, but you use also dollars. And if you live near the border in Dominican Republic, you use also the peso there. Mm -hmm. And in Dominican Republic, you use the, the dollar, you use the, the, the peso, but also there's a tourist industry. So you may be using euro. And people in the informal market are absolutely multilingual and they, and they make transactions all the time. So the, on top of the rem remittance and the fees of the big fees of the of the of the of the of these entities, there is also a, uh, an impact on these street level currencies that used to avoid hyperinflation and to give stability of all these transactions and savings of the, uh, the street level. I was wondering if you have an estimation of the impact, also taking account this level of street level of, uh, exchange. Mm. So if I heard you right, the question is about what's the, what is the level of informality in, in remittances and what impact does it have on- Currency um, exchange in here. Yes, sorry? Inform, informal currency exchange. 
at the street level. Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, there are a number of well-documented examples that are, uh, you know, prodigious and informal. So the Hawala is the most well is the is the most famous of them, right? I mean, anywhere in the world, you can walk into a jeweler and you know hand someone a hundred dollars in Delhi, and your family member can pick up that hundred dollars in in New York. Uh, I don't think there's been very impressive research on what impact that has on uh, money, but I would say, you know, dollarization is something that a lot of central banks don't really like, you know, because it kind of, it kind of has an impact on the sovereignty of the currency and their ability to manage the balance of payments, like the value of the currency. So it's kind of a double edged sword. Like if you're in Mexico, it might be more convenient to get uh, dollars than it is to pick up Mexican pesos because there's no exchange rate and you might be able to have more transparency around the fees. But I think if you're the central bankers, you don't usually like this very much because it makes it harder for you to do your job. So it's a famous kind of um, you know, dilemma between sovereignty and services for the poor. And, and it, it, we see it play out over and over and over in the financial inclusion question. That's a great question. I think the, the um, responsibility of central banks for uh, maintaining uh, living standards for the poorest of the poor uh, and their repeated failures to do so in the way of uh, fiat monies and inflation is, is one of the great scandals of the the last hundred years when they've been so powerful. Um, but um, anyway, I, I wanted to thank Sandra for that presentation, also David, and I turn now to uh, someone who is in uh, a developing country that has done quite a bit of work with uh, mobile payments and with fintech in general, uh, and can talk about some of the pluses and minuses that he sees, some of the uses and, and uh, uh, abuses of this technology. Uh, Francis? Yeah, thank you, Jim. Uh, and um, in the interest of time, I will not make a presentation. I'll probably request uh, Professor Jim to uh, circulate my um, sort of a write-up and uh, presentation that I had prepared earlier. And uh, the details of what I'm going to talk about could be found there, plus uh, some other resources that I could also share um, on the chat. Um, let me start at... Um, you know, just making note that uh, when uh, uh, Jim and David were talking about Haiti and, uh, you know, the intervention of our uh, World Bank, uh, you know, I could, I drew parallels with um, the uh, advent of um, uh, financial technology in uh, here in Kenya and other countries in Sub-Saharan Africa, uh, also being inspired by IMF World Bank through the structural adjustment plans, uh, you know, that came into play uh, in the 90s and, uh, you know, early 2000s. Uh, which saw a lot of um, uh, state-owned banks go into private hands. Um, and that is actually, uh, you know, where uh, innovations around financial technology, uh, you know, decided to start to take root uh, here in Kenya and also across uh, other countries in the region. Um, the buzzword around, uh, you know, financial technology uh, here in Kenya and in East Africa, and to some extent, uh, you know, uh, Central Africa, parts of Central Africa and Southern Africa, uh, revolves around uh, mobile money transfers. And uh, I think what comes to mind uh, when we are discussing uh, financial technology is um, the brand name M-Pesa, which is uh, uh, you know, a product of uh, a Safaricom. Safaricom is um, a product of the structural adjustment plans. Uh, you know, uh, Safaricom uh, evolved from um, you know, a government-owned uh, telco uh, when uh, you know, through uh, 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 World Bank-inspired privatizations, uh, Vodafone invested in, uh, you know, bought a stake uh, through the, the uh, you know, that process of pri privatization. Uh, and therefore, uh, the story of uh, uh, financial technology um, does not start with uh, M-Pesa or, or mobile money uh, transfers and payments, uh, you know, that started in 2007 uh, with the birth of M-Pesa. Uh, so it goes, you know, uh, way uh, before that. But let's talk about uh, M-Pesa and mobile, uh, 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 you know, uh, uh, mobile money uh, transfers. Um, and, you know, Vodafone did not just invest in Safaricom, uh, but it invested in other uh, telcos uh, uh, around East Africa. Uh, if, when you go, if you go to Tanzania, you'll find Vodafone there. If you go to Uganda, you'll find Vodafone there. 
and other countries in the, I mean, other other uh, uh, countries in the region. And therefore, uh, in a textbook case of uh, diffusion of technology, uh, you know, M-Pesa, the, the success of M-Pesa was easily, uh, you know, easily diffused into other um, uh, countries in the, in, the, in, the, in the region. And therefore, the result of that has been, uh, you know, an interconnect, interconnect, interconnectivity of uh, 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 financial services uh, because, uh, you know, it's 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 th that evolution has uh, you know enabled uh, mobile money transfers uh, across uh, across the region, and um, uh, you know there is the good side and there is a flip side to that. Uh, in that uh, you know over the last uh, ten years we have seen uh, uh, you know uh, a lot of people, a lot of uh, uh, you know um, previously ex excluded uh, um, populations being brought into the fold of uh, financial inclusion. Um, 10 years ago, um, um, uh, I mean, 20 years ago, only 10 to, uh, 5 to 10% of, uh, 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 you know, the population were within the, the, the formal financial uh, 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 sector, uh, compared to over 80%, 85% uh, today, uh, thanks to uh, financial technology. And, you know, the interconnectivity or the interface of uh, financial, of, 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 of um, uh, uh, financial technology with uh, you know other sectors of the economy has uh, allowed uh, you know easier access of uh, you know uh, basic uh, and important uh, um, um, services such as education, healthcare, uh, you know payments, uh, you know across uh, acro acro across the region. Uh, but um, as much as uh, you know uh, um, that has been the case, uh, you'll find that uh, the downside of that is that. Uh, as more payments and more interactions uh, and cross-border payments happens and facilitate uh, and it facilitates business and allows you know uh, people to send and receive money uh, and to transact business uh, not just within the country but across borders uh, it is also uh, been um, a fertile trade for uh, illicit uh, flows uh, in the region um, you know uh, stolen um, um, bullions in uh, say places like Congo find their way in Nairobi and uh, you know the payments can be facilitated back to Congo through small amounts uh, paid over uh, mobile uh, mobile payments uh, drug trade at the coast of East Africa is a major uh, is, is a major problem that uh, not just uh, the Kenyan government uh, and other East African governments uh, are trying to grapple with but also the international community, you know, uh, I think uh, Interpol and FBI have a full plate uh, with regard to the drug trade across, uh, you know, uh, the coast of East Africa. Um, the other big one is terrorism. Uh, you know, uh, 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 two events uh, in the last uh, decade, uh, you know, dominated uh, um, uh, uh, the press. The first one was the Westgate terrorist attack uh, claimed by Al Shabab. The second one was the Garissa University uh, 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 terrorist attack, again claimed by Al Shabab. And uh, investigations, uh, which are now uh, public information, reveal that. Um, these were facilitated through mobile payments. You know, the cars that they were using, uh, the hotels that they were living, uh, the materials that they bought to, you know, make bombs and transport bombs and to pay uh, people and pay bribes were all facilitated through uh, mobile uh, uh, mobile uh, payments. Um, and through those, th th just th those two uh, incidents, um, over uh, two, uh, 250 lives were lost. Um, but having said that, um, uh, you know, there is more to look up to as far as uh, 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 financial technology is concerned. Uh, in my presentation, I have uh, discussed the enablers of financial uh, technology in the region. And top among the, that list is, uh, you know, the availability of willing strategic partnerships. Uh, the implosion of uh, financial technology would not have happened without, uh, you know, uh, uh, you know uh, uh, financial institutions by way of banks that are receptive and are willing to share platforms and interface their own systems with uh, financial technology to allow payments, uh, you know, uh, receive and, you know, make, uh, make payments through their platforms. And uh, that has played a you know a, a, a big role in uh, enabling uh, you know uh, financial technology to permeate through uh, sectors of the of, of the economy and to touch many lives uh, uh, here in Kenya. Uh, the other uh, big one is uh, the acceptability of our financial technology, and part of it was inspired by the fact that uh, uh, by the fact that uh, 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 
20, 15 years ago, uh, a lot of people did not have access to you know, formal financial services. And therefore, uh, this was, they found you know, a catchment market, a catchment uh, you know, uh, population that uh, were in need of a service uh, that would be um, um, useful uh, for their day-to-day -day, uh, uh, ways of life. And um, that you know, sort of um, attitude continues, and that is why you know, uh, financial technology continues uh, 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 to grow and uh, uh, becomes acceptable uh, across um, uh, the landscape. Let me talk about uh, uh, diaspora remittances uh, because uh, you know the figures I had uh, about uh, you know um, uh, Haiti um, in a way maybe probably to a small, uh, to a smaller scale uh, you know are true about Kenya and the rest of uh, you know uh, uh, um, East African uh, neighbors. Um, in twenty in twenty ten uh, uh, diaspora remittances was about um, um, uh, uh, just below. Um, 900 uh, million US dollars compared to last year, uh, just below, uh, just about uh, $3 billion, uh, which is huge. Um, it may not be 20, 25% of the GDP as in the case of Haiti, uh, but that would be about 3% of uh, you know, our annual uh, GDP here in Kenya. Um, and you can see that uh, for the last uh, 10 years, uh, diaspora remittances uh, in Kenya have sort of uh, uh, um, you know, grown three times. And uh, this could be uh, as a result of, uh, you know, um, uh, like I said, uh, the financial services sector being now more private sector dominated with willing partnerships and um, relaxed, um, you know, uh, regulatory space uh, with the government allowing, uh, you know, uh, continually, you know, allowing um, uh, market actors in that space to uh, sort of uh, speak to each other and uh, work together to facilitate uh, payments back home. Secondly, is that um, there are a lot of, uh, you know, Kenyans and East Africans living and working abroad. And thirdly, uh, is uh, what we are discussing today, financial technology, which has allowed smaller transactions, um, perhaps at a smaller, at, at, a, at lower, you know, uh, transaction costs than uh, was happening, say, 10, 15 years ago. And that has sort of, uh, you know, encouraged more transactions to happen, um, you know, with the uh, Kenyans living in the diaspora, um, and, uh, remitting money uh, uh, to their families. Finally, I would want to talk about uh, um, what opportunities uh, there are. Um, and number one is that uh, I see uh, an opportunity um, for tapping uh, micro investors in the north uh, to deploy capital in the south uh, through uh, financial technology. Um, and you know, there are many spaces uh, where you know, um, you know, my part of the world is a capital deficient uh, uh, sort of a part of the world, and there are a lot of opportunities in healthcare, a lot of opportunities in uh, green finance, uh, micro lending. Uh, and I think we would need a totally different forum to talk about uh, micro lending, uh, which uh, is big and lots of investment opportunities. Um, secondly, I see um, an opportunity. Uh, for um, sort of uh, uh, um, disrupting the current status quo, where you find that uh, financial technology uh, being dominated by large telcos. I just talked about Vodafone, uh, you know, with partnership with some of the largest banks. And, uh, you know, that keeps, you know, transaction costs still high, perhaps not as high as they were 20, 30 years ago, but uh, still high. If you look at uh, the amount of money, uh, you know, people uh, spend, you know, in transaction fees, to remit dollars or euros uh, back home, uh, it's quite high. Uh, but there are opportunities uh, uh, to bring that one, uh, uh, to bring those transactions uh, uh, fees down through the entry of uh, many players. Finally, is um, a blockchain, and uh, uh, you know, um, block blockchain technology uh, here in Kenya is uh, not even at uh, you know um, at an ascent stage, uh, so to speak, and. The reason for this is because, uh, uh, and I had Sadra mention this, is that uh, blockchain has been uh, misold, uh, 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 you know, in, in my part of the world, and uh, you know, um, in uh, uh, pedestrian discussion, you'll find that uh, the discussion around blockchain is, uh, uh, you know, sort of uh, interchangeable with, uh, you know, uh, cryptocurrency, and you find that uh, uh, um, the proponents of a uh, uh, blockchain or uh, 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 cryptocurrency, uh, you know, sort of a um, uh, prop 
uh, the speculative uh, perspective as opposed to the technology and what solutions uh, uh, these uh, 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 can solve. Yet um, there are, there's a lot of uh, you know uh, uh, blue ocean space for blockchain to uh, take root in my side of the uh, of the globe. Uh, the opportunities are there. The infrastructure is there. The partnerships are there. Uh, it's a question of uh, more of a uh, customer education and like Jim said in his opening uh, uh, remarks that um, let's talk about uh, the users who are the end users, the consumers. And I think that's what is uh, 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 deficient. So uh, I'll pause there and uh, take any questions should there be any. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. That's uh, terrific perspective. Harrison. Hi, yeah. Um, I have a question about money laundering. Uh, money laundering, like, is a uh, or money laundering sort of reporting officers are a scarce resource even in developed economies. It just they're just better paying jobs and you know less less uh, risky jobs, right? And 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 there's there's not even much training in developed economies. So like, what does money laundering? Uh, or anti-money laundering, I should say, look like in in Kenya in the sense of like, uh, you know, we talked about kleptocracy last week. There's obviously like if if there's a there's a huge conflict of interest there if, if the state is is kleptocratic and then also uh, controlling money laundering policies. I don't know if that makes sense, but yeah, yeah, yeah. Th thank you, Harrison, and. Um, um... There is a multiplicity of forms that uh, money laundering, uh, you know, takes place uh, here in Kenya and by extension in the East African region. Um, firstly, is uh, the fact that uh, you know, uh, for uh, um, political history, historical reasons, uh, Kenya finds itself at the center of uh, the happenings. Uh, geopolitics, uh, you know, it's it's uh, uh, the geopolitics of the region melts at uh, you know in Nairobi. You find that. Um, the government of the um, the current state of Somalia, uh, the second state of Somalia, uh, was formed here in Kenya and actually operated in Kenya for uh, about um, uh, three years before it relocated to Mogadishu. Likewise, the government of South Sudan was, uh, you know, formed here in uh, 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 here in Kenya, and even way before that, the government of Uganda was uh, sort of uh, you know crystallized uh, around uh, you know uh, here in Nairobi. Um, and therefore, Nairobi finds itself as a center of interest um, uh, for all, you know, uh, the happenings uh, around the around the uh, 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 the region. Um, what happens is that uh, you know, Nairobi finds itself very attractive uh, by politicians and uh, you know, dirty business, uh, dirty money, uh, you know, from the region. I have talked about uh, lots of uh, you know, uh, stolen uh, uh, gemstones and uh, you know. Uh, uh, natural world from uh, the likes of Congo, Central Africa Republic, finding its way to Kenya, and uh, you know through the facilitation of a uh, political facilitation here in Kenya allows um, uh, you know uh, the uh, ease of transactions, and with the you know advent of a financial technology, it has become much easier. Uh, you know, uh, the collaborators here in Kenya are able to break down uh, you know uh, uh, you know huge amounts of money in smaller you know uh, uh, into smaller amounts and send it back uh, to their collaborators in uh, source countries uh, through financial technology. The other form that I would also want to discuss is uh, you know uh, what I would call outbound um, um, illicit flows where um, you know um, stolen public resources uh, find their way out of the country uh, to tax havens through uh, you know um, a very facilitative uh, financial services sector. Uh, last week we talked about the Nairobi International Financial uh, Center, which uh, you know is. Um, um, uh, if you want to look at it that way, as a launchpad to making a uh, uh, Kenya, uh, 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 you know, a new age uh, tax haven, and uh, you know, um, the fact that uh, we have uh, lots of international linkages with financial institutions allows uh, lots of uh, monies to you know leave the country uh, to tax havens, and uh, uh, um, you know, um, th those would be the two. Uh, uh, main ways that uh, you know money laundering uh, 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 happens. The other big one is a uh, drug trade, uh, which uh, you know uh, Nairobi is a major uh, shipping point. Uh, I mean, M Mombasa and the coast of Kenya is a major shipping point for drugs uh, to uh, uh, you know uh, major destinations, including uh, uh, you know Western Europe, Amsterdam, uh, and even indeed uh, you know uh, the USA. 
the last two years, I was a major case uh, involving the FBI with two major drug lords here in Kenya. And they had operated uh, between Nairobi and Kenya and facilitating drug trade across South Africa, uh, Europe, and even in the US uh, through uh, Mombasa and, uh, and, and, and Nairobi. And what happens is that their collaborators use um, uh, you know, our porous and uh, you know, uh, relaxed regulations, especially at the Nairobi Securities Exchange, to sort of uh, uh, you know, put that money into the formal financial uh, system and you know, later you know, uh, uh, take it out as clean money. Uh, you know, um, ostensibly as uh, investment money, uh, people pulling their investments from uh, 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 our capital markets. So uh, those would be the three shapes and forms that uh, money laundering uh, do happen here in Kenya. I wanted to ask a question about the ecological impact of these currencies. Uh, one thing I read is that Bitcoin is now using as much electricity, the mining of Bitcoin is using as much electricity as the entire country of Argentina. And also that it takes about 700 kilowatt hours to do a single Bitcoin transaction. Uh, it's, is this typical for other uh, currencies, uh, cryptocurrencies or, uh, and does that by itself constitute a strong argument against these currencies? I was waiting to hear someone ask that question. Um, the first question that came out of the uh, Goldman Sachs uh, Technology and Internet Conference was that question. And it's rightfully so, it's making the rounds. So Cambridge came out, Center for Alternative Finance, uh, CCAF came out with a report uh, on the energy usage of um, Bitcoin. And I just want to make one thing clear. The, cons um, the power proof of work consensus mechanism is the energy guzzler, if you want to call it that. At the moment, both Bitcoin and Ethereum, both public networks, use proof of work. Ethereum is looking to evolve to 2.0, which is proof of stake which is a lot less energy intensive, but that transition has been ongoing for the last couple of years. And frankly, um, I don't have a date for you on when exactly that's supposed to happen, um, should have happened already. But to go back to Bitcoin, um, there are a couple of things. Number one, the Bitcoin miners are always going to go where energy is most cheap. And so some folks have gotten together believe it or not, with the environmental groups out there that are criticizing the Bitcoin industry to actually map where are Bitcoin miners going? Because what they tend to do is they go to the cheapest place where they can find energy and then they drive those prices up and they'll keep moving around the world. Um, not all of them, but a lot of them do um, start moving around the world or creating more mining um, areas where there's cheap energy. And oftentimes that also collides with energy corruption and energy um, inefficiencies that happen in certain countries. So there's an element of, can we actually clean up the energy markets using that very problem? Um, and can the folks that are miners actually help instead of um, making it worse? The other leg to this, and it's a gray conversation, it's a not black and white conversation, is a lot of the mining companies are now realizing they have to go to renewables and a lot of them have. So they're using thermal, they're using solar, they're using lots of other types of mechanisms. Um, I think it is interesting that, and we've just signed on to this as GBBC, there is, um, and please keep this confidential guys, because it's mm -hmm. being announced on Thursday. Mm -hmm. There is a crypto climate change group. It's an accord that has been launched and it's working in conjunction with some of the big environmental groups out there to actually address this very issue. So um, I haven't given you a perfect answer, but there is work in progress. Here, here. Um, I have a photo that I'll dig, dig out. A friend from uh, uh, Canada sent to me of all these rooftops covered with snow, except for <laughs> two or three in this housing development. Uh, that were just melting <laughs> as a result of whatever was going on uh, in this uh, <clears throat> computer-friendly uh, housing development. Um, let's see. I'd like to uh, just ask if, just poll the, the, the uh, 
the questions here. We have Tobias has a, has a question. Uh, anybody else, get your hands in up now. And, uh, and I also wanted to see if Andreas uh, in Germany has any comments based on the EU perspective on all this stuff, because you know it's an issue that is of global significance. Uh, and the EU has got its hands full, but maybe it's worrying about crypto and fintech. Uh, anyway, uh, Tobias. Yeah, thank you very much for giving me the opportunity to ask the question and thank you very much for the speakers and the questioners for the very interesting comments, insights and information. Um, my question is a bit more broader in the sense that um, from my perspective, also um, maybe everyone has seen that in the global financial crisis 2008 and 9, that uh, the finance sector kind of decoupled from the regular economy, if I may call it that way, um, assuming that usually this, the, economic, the economic system should serve society and, the, and the, the goals societies aim for, and the financial sector serves the economy to work well uh, through providing that so maybe called blood for the global economic body. Um, how does uh, this whole development of cryptocurrencies um, might shift those dependencies? Probably this is a dual use debate we now could have, but do you see chances that this whole development could uh, again strengthen this dependency, society, economics, finance? Or is it uh, foreseeable right now from the current developments you're very uh, into that uh, this might contribute to a broader uh, discrepancies or a stronger tendency in that direction that I've just described? Who wants to take that question? It's a, a great point, which is, uh, I think part of what we were suggesting earlier that fintech and crypto might provide opportunities to help the poor. Uh, but if my uh, reading of the evidence today is, um, is right, at least on the remittance side, it's taken uh, quite a while to get uh, to make progress there. But more generally, think... where do you say, can... where do you see fintech? or any of these technologies making a difference? Or is this another case where the we happy few will run off and uh, the Silicon Valley types will profit from uh, all this to extraordinary degrees and the rest of us will be left outside the wall? I can take part of that question um, um, on how, uh, you know, what is the nexus uh, uh, the nexus uh, between uh, fintechs and uh, blockchain uh, in uh, impacting the poor. Um, because traditionally, the way uh, foreign uh, direct investment uh, has come to my part of the globe is uh, through uh, you know investments by large you know um, institutions uh, um, um, uh, in the north. Uh, and lately, lots of private equity funds looking for big uh, deals in my part of the globe. Uh, but those those deals are not as many as uh, you know big capital in the north would want uh, uh, would want to uh, to see. Uh, what is available are smaller investment opportunities that may not be you know of scale and may be attractive for uh, you know large investors. Uh, and that is where you know uh, 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 you know a fintech comes because. Uh, uh, you know, fintechs allows you know uh, uh, the scalability of investments uh, 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 from the north. You know, small-time investors um, maybe um, um, you know a thousand dollar sort of an investor, um, as opposed to a million-dollar investor uh, or looking for investment opportunities in the south. Um, the where you know where blockchain comes into play is uh, you know the possibility of bulking up, uh, you know, these investments from the North, you know, uh, several, uh, you know, a uh, thousand dollar investors in the North uh, backed up through uh, uh, blockchain technology and, uh, you know, uh, deploying these uh, uh, to investment opportunities uh, 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 in the South. Um, and, uh, you know, 
what we have seen in the past is that advisors, uh, you know, um, if I may draw, uh, you know, uh, 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 parallels with, uh, you know, banks that facilitate uh, our payments with high fees, there is also, you know, advisors who also take up a uh, lot of fees, uh, you know, from uh, investments coming from the north, and uh, you know, through this scalability, these fees may also come down, and uh, you know. Uh, provide more value uh, for investors in the north uh, as we facilitate, uh, you know, uh, capital deficient deficiency uh, uh, in the south, uh, where these investments may, you know, uh, unlock uh, services uh, uh, for the poor, uh, like in healthcare, uh, in green finance, and so on and so forth. Very helpful, David. Do you want I might to add a little something to that. Yeah, I mean, just to build on what Francis said, I think if you want to do a really systematic analysis of what it does to the financial sector and draw parallels to 2008-9, that's very difficult. Uh, I, I probably wouldn't try to answer that question. But what I would say is that uh, the spirit of financial technology and blockchain is, is all about democratizing access to services and particular capital markets. So to build on Francis's example, you know, we have these accredited investor rules in the United States that basically say, unless you have a net worth of more than a million dollars, you can't invest in private assets or, or, or private companies, right? Like other than real estate. And so you could say, well, that's a necessary investor protection. It's good that the law does that and keeps these unsophisticated people like out of risky private investments. But there's another way to read it, which is that, hey, if I don't have a net worth of more than a million dollars, I can't get my, my fingers on any of these opportunities to, to grow my net worth. And so what's kind of fantastic about uh, crowdfunding and other like tokenization tools that blockchain enables is that you can own a small piece of an asset now. You can own like, you know, a thousandth of a piece of a, a Mark Rothko painting or whatever you like. So, you know, uh, and, and in that vein, you know, the whole the spirit of the DeFi movement is that people can do their own banking now, you know, you can custody your own assets, you don't need a bank to custody them, you have cryptographic codes that can allow you to hold stuff and that the blockchain will be the guarantor of, you know, that you have full custody. So I, I don't think it's so simple, but I think some of the sort of like bottoms up evidence is that you're you're really increasing the availability of services for people that are excluded from the more traditional financial system and who and, and who, you know, rightly the banks deem as not commercially serious and that's why they don't get bank accounts. So I, I would probably, you know, end with that. Sandra, I'll leave you the parting shot there. This, this idea of bundling investments and getting uh, making it possible for uh, on both sides of the equation for smaller borrowers and smaller investors to get uh, to meet and uh, securely and arrange deals. Is that something you see blockchain as facilitating? Yeah, um, I'm going to harken back to what I said about this being a collaboration technology. And um, Tobias, just so you know, I sat in London during the financial crisis at Morgan Stanley in the heart of a meltdown. Um, I saw five rounds of layoffs. I saw people, men, grown men crying. Um, because we thought the entire world financial system was going to come down. Um, having gone through that and understanding that we are also going through another shift here in paradigm and processes, this is an opportunity for people to actually realign what they want to see in the world and have that reflected in the systems that we build. And so I think it's absolutely tantamount that um, and where I spend most of my time is giving uh, access and opportunity for people to build around the world. And frankly, um, I wanna see not just, you know, great companies coming out of the US and the UK, but I wanna see great companies coming out of Kenya and Nigeria and everywhere else in the world because people are working on blockchain all over the world. The problem is matching up the folks who are actually trying to help people on the ground at grassroots level with the capital that they need to actually grow these networks and um, businesses. And that includes SendFriend. Like SendFriend may be sitting here, in, you know, headquartered in New York, but the reality is they're focusing on remittance, um, helping people in the Philippines. And, um, you know, we need to be feeding fintechs like that and, and making sure they get capital access. It's easier if you're in the US for sure, but um, how do we make it equitable everywhere? So there's also another movement Believe it or not, where blockchain does play a small role, um, of also 
looking at capital and capital deployment. Um, I think right now there's good uses of it and there's some experimenting going on that has some bad actors in it. And this is the thing about you know, emerging technologies. There's a lot of people with good intent. They're always gonna be bad actors. So we've got to figure out how to um, evolve the good side and also then maintain and, and kind of you know, squash out the, the bad and the rogue elements that try to come in and take advantage. Great. Andreas, I just wanted to see if you had anything to say from the vantage point of the Europeans' perspective, just quickly here, because we're running out of time. Um, turn your speaker on. Okay. First of all, I have to say I was very impressed by the speech of Sandra. Thank you very much. It was very helpful. You know, and I have to say, you know, we're fighting money laundering for over 30 years with the Foundation of the Financial Action Task Force. The results are very weak. I mean, we have much more money laundering than 30 years ago. And when I hear the new technologies in the hands of bad actors, I think then we have lost the war. It would be very, very difficult for uh, the, the, the governments to get in control because we are far behind in the curve, like in artificial intelligence, like in other new technologies that per se are very good for you, for the mankind. But in reality, they most of the time work the other way. That's all I want to say. Very helpful. Well, I'm going to conclude on that note. And uh, David, I see your mute is off, but do you have something? But, um, generally, we, we don't think of money as a problem of philosophy, but I mean, there are philosophers like John Searle, who have spent a lot of time talking about uh, why, what money is and you know, basically says it's a kind of social construction. Very interesting if you get a chance to read Searle's work. Um, but I think this conversation has convinced me that this is a, a, a real uh, you know, justifiably interesting global justice concern because there are so many side effects of the way we uh, we decide on these conventions and administer them necessarily across borders. So it is a global problem. Thomas? Sorry, nothing more to say than to thank you all for your wonderful contributions. Uh, I've got everything recorded and within a few days, it will be up on the Global Justice Program website. Thank you all very, very much. Great. Thanks very much, Thank everyone. You.